and we are live. Please welcome Marie. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. I'm Marie Dennis, Senior Advisor to the Secretary General of Pax Christi International, and I am honored to serve as the moderator of what I know will be a very interesting conversation about religious leadership in addressing global crises in the 21st century. If we want to build more peaceful and resilient societies, we need inclusive, participatory, whole of society programs that engage the broad community. Involving religious actors in building inclusive peace is highly strategic. Faith actors are key leaders and influencers in building peace. They are often in positions of trust and influence and play a vital role in building resilience, including amplifying messages to change behaviors, shaping public attitudes, providing social programming, advocating for social justice, and bridging political or societal divides. But what does effective religious leadership and what do multi-faith movements look like in reality? Excuse me. Today we are joined, <clears throat> pardon me, by Evgeny Finevsky, <clears throat> Oscar nominated director of the documentary film Francesco, <clears throat> that gives viewers a close look at the remarkable leadership role of Pope Francis in addressing and drawing attention <clears throat> to a multitude of crises afflicting our world. Excuse me. Evgeny Panevsky is an Israeli American film director, producer, and cinematographer who lives in the United States. In 2016, Panevsky was nominated for an Academy Award and for Emmys for his documentary, Winter on Fire. Following Mr. Panevsky on our panel are four distinguished religious leaders. Aza Karam, the Secretary General of Religions for Peace, the largest multi-religious leadership platform in the world with 92 national and six regional interreligious councils. Archbishop Emeritus Antonio Ledesma, the Archbishop of Cagayan de Oro in the Philippines and former chairman of the Catholic Bishops Conference of the Philippines Episcopal Commission on Interreligious Dialogue. Tahil Sharma, the regional coordinator in North America with United Religions Initiative. Tahil is an interfaith activist based in Los Angeles, involved in efforts for interfaith literacy and social justice. And his beatitude, Michelle Sabah, the Patriarch Emeritus of Jerusalem, who served as the Archbishop and Latin Patriarch of Jerusalem from 1988 to 2008. La mayor parte de los habitantes del planeta se declaran creyentes. Esto debería provocar un diálogo entre las religiones. No debemos dejar de orar por él y colaborar con quienes piensan distinto. Confío en Buda. Creo en Dios. Creo en Jesucristo. Creo en Dios. Allah. Muchos piensan distinto, sienten distinto, buscan a Dios o encuentran a Dios de diversa manera. En esta multitud, en este abanico de religiones, Hay una sola certeza que tenemos para todos. Todos somos hijos de Dios. Creo en el amor. Creo en el amor. Creo en el amor. Creo en el amor. Confío en vos para difundir mi petición de este mes. 
que el diálogo sincero entre hombres y mujeres de diversas religiones conlleve frutos de paz y justicia. Confío en tu oración. Hello again, and a warm welcome to Eugenia Fanevsky. Thank you so much for being with us. Uh, we have many of us, most of us have appreciated tremendously your beautiful film on Pope Francis. We'd like to begin with a few questions to you. What was your motivation for creating a film about a religious figure like Pope Francis? And what did you learn about the importance of his leadership and of faith leadership, in particular on global issues impacting our world? What, what unique role do you think religious leaders can play in addressing global crises? I think, first of all, again, good morning and good evening and good afternoon for <laughs> every person in the different parts of the world, it's different time zone. So I need to go back to some of my previous work that I did in 2016, like Vinch on Fire, where I was on the streets of Maidan, where I witnessed the interface in real time, where for the first time I, who was born in former Soviet Union, where religion kind of was put it aside and after revolution, in 1917, religion was uh, kind of uh, isolated and was kind of portrayed as the enemy to the people. I was raised as atheist, despite my Jewish blood and Jewish heritage. So for the first time in 2013, 14, during the revolution of dignity in Ukraine, I witnessed interface. I witnessed the interface dialogue. I witnessed how almost every face was present on Maidan Square during the revolution. Leader of every face was there, praying together with the people, bringing their spirits up. And for the first time in history, I witnessed how almost every leader side by side been there with the people, without pushing people into the religious spectrum, but supporting them in all ways. And that was my first experience. I also saw something on my journey with the Christ from Syria, movie where I brought the plight of Syrian refugees, where I literally educated the world what's happened in Syria, what's happened from the beginning of Arab Spring, from the beginning of the revolution in Syria into the more sophisticated world of 2015-16, where we saw the majority of the Syrians leaving Syria, going to Jordan, Lebanon and many other places, and some of them, of course, European Union. I try to educate the world that these people not just coming out of their homes into the European Union because they wanted to take over. They are fleeing because they're seeking shelter for their kids. And again, for the first time in my life, I saw how the country that had so many different religious groups was divided through different issues manipulation of the religion. And for the first time, I, for example, I experienced how Islam was also religion and also fundamentalism, which I learned about ISIS, Al-Qaeda, Jabhat al-Nusra, talking to the Imams who were explaining to me how they've been prosecuted for not participating in a fundamental things. So for me, it was some kind of a red flag and also a journey into the darkest side of humanity that I witnessed in two of my movies, positive and negative. And I wanted to find hope, love, light in my next journey. And this next journey led me to the Pope Francis in whom I found this spiritual guidance, but in the same time, humanity. I saw how from the previous days being Archbishop of Buenos Aires, Cardinal Bergoglio or later Pope Francis, he was trying to bring these interface values, interface dialogue with his friends who've been rabbis, imams, who've been Catholic, Catholic leaders, who've been Buddhists. He tried to kind of show to the people that we're all brothers, 
even in his letters to me, in his interaction, he always calling each of us brothers. And I think this beautiful interaction really inspired me to go and tell through his actions story about all what's surrounding us to open to a viewer ability to see how world is distracted, damaged, and in the same time, give opportunity through his amazing work to build a better future, to do a reset and to reevaluate all what we already destroyed and through interface dialogue, through uh, humanity and love to build something different. I think that was a real motivation to go towards Pope Francis and ex tell everything around us. Because the movie, as you saw, have almost every subject, every headline of today's world. And I think that was the inspiration. And for me, it was a personally healing process. I think for me, who been struggling with post-trauma after the Syrian war, it's a, it was a true healing process to go side by side and through the people whose hearts and minds he touched to learn more, to witness more, and to bring through my visual storytelling to the bigger world. So I think that was the inspiration. What I learned, I think dialogue, it's the most important thing in a peace building, in a building more human kind of world that we are missing in today's world. Today's world is super divided. If you will look on right and left, almost every issue that's surrounding us is the issue where religion is either manipulated or taken in a different perspective. Even in today's headlines of uh, Afghanistan, we're looking at the Taliban, who is, uh, in my opinion, it's a terroristic organization. It's nothing to do with the proper Islam, which people really should be taking seriously and learning. So I think any aspect of today's life, Middle East, Jerusalem, uh, you have the attitude. I've been raised in Israel, so I've been many times in Jerusalem. And for me, Jerusalem is small and very historical place is always been a pain because we see how many people not able to find a peace in this small and beautiful historical place. So for me, looking at the all religious aspects and ability to bring this dialogue, it's always a goal and importance. And what we can see from today's actions of Pope Francis, last week, he had every faith leader in Vatican. They signed a tremendous engagement for the world leaders to support faith and science to combat climate change. It's a tremendous thing where we see how the, for the first time, faith aligned together with the science to combat something that is important to preserve this planet for the future. And next day, they signed something about education. I know how important education for Pope Francis. In fact, we based on a movie just released curriculum for the schools and we're working on a study guide because education is really important. And one of the main points in a curriculum and a study guide is interface dialogue. We need to teach people not to judge by their religious beliefs and feel that each of us are brothers. We all even, we all children of God, no matter how we call him. Some of us can call him Allah, some of can call Abraham Avenu, some Jesus Christ, but the most important, it's one God above all of us. So I think that's the tremendous values that I personally learned from Pope Francis. And I still learning. Thank you so much. Um, and again, thank you for the extraordinary film that you have produced. Uh, it was inspiring and challenging and uh, conveyed in many ways exactly what you have described. Let us just take a few moments to, um, to see a few pieces from this film uh, before we move on. Oh. 
come la tragica pandemia di coronavirus ci sta dimostrando, abbiamo mancato nel custodire la terra, la nostra casa giardino, l'abbiamo inquinata, l'abbiamo depredata, mettendo in pericolo la nostra stessa vita. This is a man who, who's opened his heart to the hearts of all of humanity. This is a man who cries with humanity, who laughs with humanity, who suffers with humanity. This is Pope Francis. La humanidad vive una crisis que no es solamente económica y financiera. También es ecológica. educativa, moral, umana. I'm convinced that we can make a difference. I'm sure. Pedimos perdón por los abusos sexuales por parte de miembros cualificados de la Iglesia. volta e per questo perché tutti siamo fratelli vogliamo la pace ser la voz pero no de una manera programmatica me sale solo y también por mi sangre migrante una persona que pensa soltanto in fare muri e non fare ponti non è cristiano I think God made him experience what people experience. Queda feo que lo diga un papa, no sé. Las quiero mucho. Початку. Представники усіх конфесій були на Майдані як мужі молитви. Различні релігії, різні конфесії, не вступаючи в противоріччя, в конфлікт друг з другом, об'єднувалися для досягнення общих цілей, які для всіх важливі. Ми старалися всіляко допомагати духовно, не тільки молитися, але спілкуватися з людьми на Майдані, щоб люди не падали духом, щоб у людей була глибока віра у те, що вони стоять на правильній дорозі, що вони роблять добрі справи не лише свого особистого майбутнього, а для майбутнього нашої держави. Очевидно, що ми діалогували із тими, хто там перебував, закликаючи їх до суто мирного протесту. Бо саме мирний протест є ознакою великої сили і мужності. Бо першим за зброю хапається слабкий. Когда вот случалась уже эта переломная, скажем, ситуация на Майдане, когда снайпера стреляли, то за, за этими людьми, которые там стояли, были люди, которые на коленях молились на Розарии. Никогда никто не мог себе уявить, что в третьем тысячелетии в цивилизованной Европе мы можем стать свидетелями холоднокровного расстрела беззбройных людей. Життя, яке люди віддали за волю, за незалежність нашої батьківщини, за краще майбутнє, це є уроком для кожного із нас, що ми дійсно повинні бути патріотами своєї держави, іноді навіть і готовими віддати своє життя за правду і за свої переконання, за якими стоїмо на тому чи іншому майдані. Кожна субота, ось вчора у нас була Сашабат, ми молились на Торі за благополуччя України, щоб тут були, що Всевишній допомог їй подняться материально, духовно, встать на ноги. Мне кажется, это не то, что чудо, а люди поверили, то есть у них осталось вера. Самое страшное – убить в людях веру. Этот Майдан был, ну как сказать, победили, потому что верили. Когда казалось, что уже 
э, наступили самые тяжелые времена, всегда Господня помощь давала людям надежду и веру стоять до конца, и мы выстояли. Когда все захиталось, все шукали точки опоры. И как раз эту опору нашли в духовном жизни, в духовном вимірі, в том диалозе между Богом и людиною. И Бог выслушал молитвы. Эти события, они нас объединили, мы все поняли, что мы украинцы. У нас есть происхождение разные, но все мы дети Украины. Мусульмане, иудеи, христиане разных конфессий, буддисты, люди просто неверующие, да, с таким уважением относились друг к другу, так уважительно относились к религиозному выбору своего ближнего, что можно сказать, что родилось новое сообщество, сообщество толерантных людей, которые вот в этот тяжелый, трагический час увидели в друг друге человека, такого же патриота Украины, который любит свою страну и готов за нее умереть. As you just saw, that's a clip from my movie on Maidan, which was Oscar nominated. And as you saw, for me, who was raised previously in former Soviet Union, and Ukraine was a part of former Soviet Union, mm -hmm. as atheist, I witnessed something that was incredible. Every leader whom you saw there of the face was on Maidan, and side by side was praying with the people. And I think, like uh, Imam said, they were respecting each other, and it was a dialogue. And I think that dialogue helped and unite people and allowed them to win this revolution of dignity. And I think what we all trying to achieve following for Francis, following your amazing work, I think what we trying, we trying to unite people. We trying to unite people by all means of humanity and not just trying to emphasize one religion. Pope Francis not trying to unite just the Catholics, he's trying to unite the world. He's looking at the people as people. He's not looking, they're Catholics and they're my parish and I will be taking care of them. No, he's looking at every human being. Mm. And I think the most important for every human being in today's world, specifically that we are still in pandemic, specifically that we suffered a big loss. And I think pandemic taught us a lot of things and a lot of lessons. I think it is important to emphasize that today the world is a thread line. Today is the world missing unity. Today is the world in a war. We have invisible war with the pandemic, with the virus, and we have visible wars that we as human created because of the religious differences. Religion was manipulated. Religion was a kind of uh, in, done into different interpretation to serve some personal agendas. I think it is important in today's world to rethink everything and to rebuild a healthy, better future that we all can preserve this planet and build a healthy and loving society where people can respect each other. Exactly like we saw it on Maidan, exactly like Pope Francis is trying to do. Thank you again, Evgeny. Uh, that second clip was from Winter on Fire. Is that correct? Um, a, a remarkable yes. film, uh, an earlier film. Um, thank you so much. What the stories that you're telling, uh, you're lifting up the potential for nonviolent approaches to dealing with the challenges that we're facing in the world now. Uh, that effort is so important. Thank you very much. We'd like to move now to um, our second uh, panelist, Aza Karam, again, the Secretary General of Religions for Peace. Um, welcome to you and thank you so much for being with us, Aza. Just a few questions to, um, to begin the conversation with you. As a leader of a multi-faith organization, can you talk about the role of multi-faith collaboration in addressing global crises? What is the impact of multi-faith action? And what can we learn from Pope Francis uh, about multi-faith collaboration? What are steps that leaders of various faiths can take to emphasize the importance of multi-faith collaboration? 
Sure. Thanks. Well, first of all, thank you very much, um, Mary, for the opportunity to be with you here today. Thanks you to Pax Christi International and the Alliance for Peace Building for hosting this beautiful session at a really timely moment and on a very, very typical issue. It's a great privilege and an honor to be with you all here today and especially to be uh, having to speak after Yevgeny, which is not something I would have uh, advised anybody to do. Uh, but I think one answer, really clear answer to the question about multi-faith collaboration, we have just witnessed in that clip from Evgeny's movie of Winter on Fire, the impact of every single religious leader coming together in to address everyone, to serve as one amongst their people, it wasn't just one religious leader. It was at least three that we saw in that clip. That is the impact of multi-religious collaboration. It is what also Yevgeny spoke about. It is the healing that takes place not only by one leader, not only through one community, not only through one religion, but effectively, if we maintain that religions matter to most people's lives, which statistically they absolutely do, then we must understand that it is a key to the healing in most people's lives. And therefore, when all religions come together, when religious leaders in particular come together, that is a moment of the most intense bridge building and healing that can happen, not only for one individual faith tradition. Um, again, as Yevgeny mentioned, and I would underline, his Holiness Pope Francis's appeal extends way beyond the Catholic community, way beyond. It goes to it goes throughout the world. The man is the Pope of the Catholics, but the faith leader of all faiths. And in that respect, I think we have to pause to consider why one man who is really a leader of one 16% Catholics are 16, one six percent of the world. Why is the leader of 16% of the world's religions perceived as such a valuable, emotionally charged, wonderfully welcomed faith leader by all faiths, because he speaks the language of all faiths. He does not only limit himself to only, I mean, excuse me for that, I speak as somebody who comes from a non-Catholic tradition. He does not limit himself to the language, the rhetoric of, of even just of the Holy Bible. The man speaks of faith. The man speaks of love. The man speaks of compassion. The man speaks of mercy. These are all values that are deeply held and fully maintained by all faith traditions, including indigenous traditions around the world. So he speaks the language of faith that is universal. By the way, the same values that are pertinent to all faith traditions, those exact same values that are common to all faith traditions are the same values upon which the Universal Declaration of Human Rights is based. And even though we will hear till the day we die most probably, some people say, oh, we don't need human rights, we have our own faith tradition. Well, you know what? Actually, here is a secular document that is built upon the values of all faiths. So it is actually quite a wonderful document. The language that Pope Francis speaks to, of, about, is the language that is common to all faiths. And it is therefore the fundamental language of decency and compassion and mercy that we are hungry for. I think one of the things that we have to be cautious about is to understand that the power of faith is precisely not only all good, all healing, all wonder, all love, the power of faith can also be abused and misused, which means it is even more imperative to work with faith and to come together. Because it's very rare that you find different religions abusing at the same time. They abuse, but they abuse separately and different people. But when different religions come together, it is often that moment of the most beautiful, in your human spirit. So that's why it's important to emphasize that the healing is only compounded when faiths are actually able to come together. Um, Yevgeny mentioned the meeting that, uh, that was hosted in the Vatican by Pope Francis, I think a couple of weeks ago, where he invited different faith communities to come together and to sign on to this declaration of commitment to safeguard our planet. Hugely important. Also very important to notice he's not the only one doing that. 
very important to give credit to the other faith leaders who do come to the table in spite of resistance, deep, heavy, bitter resistance from their own communities. We have to be able to uphold each and every faith leader, just as we uphold each and every human rights defender, who often do so at the expense of their own well-being, their own peace, and their own security. He does that too. His holiness is not exactly having a very lovely time in his own community. He struggles plenty. He pays a very heavy price, as do other faith leaders. What we must be able to do is to show respect and appreciation in equal measure for all faith leaders, like his beatitude, uh, uh, his beatitude, Reverend Sabah, who has faced plenty of hardship in his own community in order to uphold what he believes in and what he knows most of the world believes in, which is that peaceful coexistence is the only option that we have. It's not like we have several other options. It's the only option that humanity has. We must be able to pay respect to each of these faith leaders. We must be able to acknowledge, Yevgeny, I look forward to your next couple of movies, which will highlight the work of other faith leaders from different faith traditions who also take that leap of faith to work together and alongside other faith leaders who will take that leap of faith and do so on a daily basis to protect what they value most, which is their faith that is mirrored in every single other faiths. Because yes, we are extremely fortunate to have Pope Francis. The world needs him. The world also needs those who walk alongside him from other faith traditions. Think of a particular image of the civil rights movement here in the United States in the 1960s. We had Martin Luther King Jr., absolutely, who was a remarkable a remarkable voice, but next to him was Rabbi Herschel, and next to him was another imam and a priest, and that image shall forever be seared in our memory as the civil rights movement's point. We must pay tribute to all faith leaders equally. We must highlight them, and we must respect each and every one of them, because at the end of the day, if we're serious about the multi-religious, then we have to show the multi-religious leaders who come together. We must show the women and the youth in those movements who also sacrifice, who also commit, who also work day and night. Those are leaders too, lest we make the mistake of assuming that only if you are an ordained person, you are a leader of faith. No, faith leaders are faith leaders. They come from across all walks of life. And some of them, even some of them are also LGBTIQ people. Some of them are people who are shunned deeply by their own institutions, but they are faith leaders of the most beautiful caliber. That is what we must do as we acknowledge multi-faith and multi-religious coexistence. COVID taught us a very, very hard lesson. It showed us unequivocally, irrevocably, indisputably, how religious communities, religious organizations, religious institutions, faith-based non-governmental organizations are the frontline responders to the crises, every single humanitarian crisis, they are the frontline responders. Why? Because they don't have to be parachuted in. They don't have to be traveling in on a plane. They're in the communities. They are of the communities. They are by the communities. They are the communities. Mm -hmm. And therefore they are the first responders. The first schools, the first hospitals, the first shelters that we have all known across humanity are the faith-based and faith-inspired ones. So COVID shows us multitudes who are serving and serving 110%. But guess what? COVID also showed us that they don't all work together, that it is very difficult to get them to work together. When my organization, Religions for Peace, set up a multi-religious humanitarian fund, assuming that everyone would want to contribute something so that we religious communities and organizations can actually work together to serve together. Hey, we're facing the same thing. All of us facing the same thing in the same communities, in the same places. Why is the Catholics working on their own and the Protestants working on their own and the Muslims and Sunnah and Shia and the Why? Can we not work together? Can we not just do a little bit together? And guess what? It's darn difficult to get a single contribution, including from the world's largest organizations, the world's wealthiest religious organizations. Because, because we are too busy. We have so much to do. We don't have time to coordinate. We don't have resources. We're struggling for resources ourselves. Well, guess what? The real test of our faith is in the extent to which we are willing to give that which is dearest to us, not only to my, our own organizations, not only to those who look like us and talk like us and speak like us and pray like us, but to those who are different from us, but who still need our humanity. That multi-religious test remains till today, the biggest test of all faiths. The day we learn to give of that which is most precious to us, 
for others other than ourselves is the day that we come to terms with the most beautiful aspect of faith. And that is the giving and the service way beyond dialogue, Yevgeny and the colleagues, way beyond dialogue is the service. And that is what the movie showed, the last clip of Winter on Fire. Thank you. Thank you so much, Aza, that is such so important to be speaking the language of all faiths and acting together. Beautiful. Thank you. Um, now we'll have a few words from um, Archbishop Ledesma in the Philippines. Uh, Archbishop Ledesma has sent us a message um, that because his co internet connection is not too reliable. So uh, we will hear a few words from him now. I am Archbishop Antonio Ledesma, Archbishop Emeritus of the Archdiocese of Cagayan de Oro and also formerly Bishop of the Prelature of Ipil, both in the island of Mindanao in the Philippines. I have been involved in Christian-Muslim dialogue over the past uh, 25 years, and it has been my experience that I will be glad to share with you. In 1995, the Prelature of Ipil was attacked uh, by a motley group of Muslim rebels and uh, about 60 people were killed, uh, massacred in the town center. The town, the marketplace was uh, burned down. That was a year before I was appointed uh, the bishop there of the e uh, prelature of Epil. But it was in that context that uh, the previous bishop, Bishop Escalar, and myself said that we should really work for a culture of peace in the area. And that is what we did. We tried to give seminars on a culture of peace to mix communities of both Christians, Muslims, also Protestants, and other indigenous people groups so that we can form this culture of peace among all the cultural groups in that area. And I'm glad that that has uh, been done because that has been one way to also modify and bring about peace in the situation. The first efforts for peace negotiations with the Muslim communities took place between the government and the Moro National Liberation Front. And there was actually a peace agreement signed by both sides in 1996. About that same time, it was also the occasion for the formation of our Bishops Ulama Forum. This was really a dialogue forum among bishops of Mindanao and uh, Muslim uh, religious leaders. And since then, we have also been periodically meeting to show that both religious leaders of both sides are really working for this culture of peace. Later on, uh, after a few years with the peace agreement with the Moro National Liberation Front, another group, the Moro Islamic Liberation Front, also was formed to continue the struggle for uh, genuine autonomy among the Muslim communities. And it was this effort that we tried to continue again with our dialogue up to the year 2017-18 uh, when uh, the new Bangsamoro Organic Law was signed and the Bangsamoro Autonomous Region for Muslim Mindanao was formed. So it has been a long peace process, first with the MNLF and then also with the MILF. I have continued to be an active member of the Bishops Ulama Conference, as it is now called. In fact, I am a member of the Tripartite Commission that helps uh, promote and prepare the agenda for the dialogue meetings. And in that sense, it has been a continued effort on both sides to show that the top religious leaders in Mindanao, of both Christian and Muslim communities, including Protestant bishops, are also working for this peace process. So I think that has been a missing ingredient, the spiritual dimension for peace among Christian and Muslim communities. And we hope that this will continue now with the creation of the Bangsamoro Autonomous Region for Muslim Mindanao, that they themselves will realize that uh, we are all people of peace, following also the joint letter message of Pope Francis 
and the Grand Imam in Dubai calling for human fraternity among all religious communities. I think it is important to continue with this multi-faith dialogue and collaboration among Christian and Muslim communities because it is really one way to show that we have a culture of peace in Mindanao. In fact, only about a month ago, we had a webinar here about uh, and speakers from Indonesia and the Philippines talking about uh, Miriam in the Quran and Mary in the Bible and how Mary, Miriam herself, can really be a focus for joint devotion among Christians and Muslims. And we can even call her the mother of peace for all our Christian and Muslim communities. So we hope that this multi-faith collaboration will continue, not only really for the sake of peace alone, but for the sake of development and human fraternity among all peoples of goodwill. It was lovely to hear from Archbishop Ledesma, whose experience of interfaith cooperation and work for peace is so deep and wide. We're very happy now to welcome Tahir Sharma with the United Religions Initiative. Uh, welcome, Tahir. Thank you so much for being with us as well. A few questions to start the conversation with you. Non-Abrahamic faiths like Hinduism have a unique perspective and religious leadership. Could you talk about effective religious leadership in Hinduism? What can we learn from Hinduism about faith leadership and what can Hindus learn from someone like Pope Francis? We, could you turn your, your microphone on, Takil? Can you hear me now? Yes, that's yeah. fine. Excellent, thank you. Um, to follow Dr. Karam's point, I think the fact that I have to follow Evgeny, uh, the former Archbishop and Dr. Karam may have been not necessarily a disservice, but a lot to prep for. So <laughs> I, I appreciate being uh, building the momentum in me. Um, but to your question, Marie, um, Hinduism does not function as a monolith. And I think that's the first lesson that many of the Abrahamic traditions, but the people of the world need to understand about the nature of religious leadership. Um, religious leadership doesn't look like a single idea or concept or action. And therefore it becomes incumbent upon all of us to be able to engage in religious leadership, however it's suitable for our contexts. And in the Hindu context particularly, it means 1 billion people being 1 billion leaders. It means having the responsibility to understand the role of leadership in the context of where everyone is standing in their Hinduism, in their faith, and in the problems that they might be facing individually and collectively in the world. But secondly, the idea of being a religious leader in Hinduism also requires a better understanding of interdependence. The idea of the soul existing within all things is not merely the, this idea that the cosmos or this primordial energy is just there. It means we have a responsibility towards it. We have an opportunity to strive for justice. We always have a chance to be able to serve ourselves by serving others. And that kind of leadership that is constantly shifting, constantly in contact with one another, means that this is an energy that we can't really hold back. And I think the Hindu tradition offers an opportunity to understand that not just for an energy, but actually being a feminine concept. I think Hinduism has for many centuries and for many millennia offered a perspective on understanding not just the power for what it is, but understanding power as feminine. That there is an intersectionality of this leadership being something that goes beyond binaries, that goes beyond just the mere understandings of keeping things within a, a square framework. Um, and I think from the perspective of what we might see um, the Hindu community learning from Pope Francis is I think being audacious and courageous at the same time. Uh, Dr. Karam said this very explicitly when 
Pope Francis knows that he has created enemies within his own space. He didn't do that just because he wanted to have fun. He did it because there was such a need to change norms and quote unquote traditions within the Catholic Church because there was a standard and a precedent for oppression. There was a standard for suffering that should not have coexisted with the true values of what Christianity brings to the table. And in the Hindu community, being able to strive for a, an organized approach to having community has not existed for quite some time, unfortunately. You may find that Hindu communities exist around the world, but they do not work in sync with one another. They do not build relationships with one another. And I think this is something that the Catholic Church can equally teach to the Hindu tradition because the nature of that collaboration remains very low within the Eastern traditions. We don't function in hierarchy the same way, so that interdependence model is very important to us. But with a lack of that kind of administrative process, we don't actually have an opportunity to build momentum like many Christian, Muslim, and Jewish traditions and communities do. Now, as they look at each other, they might find a lot of ways to be able to learn you know, things that they may um, be building over time in terms of their frameworks, but they actually can't teach each other some things. Um, there are some things that they have to go out of the pulpits for and to go to the pews to learn. Um, and one of the things that I think is important to do is to open the floodgates of power when it comes to the opportunity of showing religious leadership. Many times, unfortunately, we come to um, the work of religious leadership as only those who hold the giant crucifixes on their neck, his beatitude, this is not a, an offense to you. Um, those that may wear hats, those that may wear robes, those that may you know, present themselves speaking in the tongues of scriptures and tradition. But that is not the nature of religion and spirituality. It never has been. So therefore, how can we define the idea of religious leadership as a monolith. I came into this space being called a religious leader and a part of me doesn't accept that because I don't look like any of those things. I don't present myself in that way. But that's exactly the point. Religious leadership is an all encompassing idea that we are manifesting God in their purest form by saying that this power, this energy and this ability to strive for justice doesn't just look like us praying. It looks like us marching. It looks like us fighting for justice. It looks like us seeing the oppressed being uplifted and equalized. And that takes a lot of work. It does take a lot of responsibility for those who are LGBTQ, for those who might be on the lower parts of the caste system, for those who are socioeconomically um, distraught, for those who are suffering immensely because of the COVID-19 pandemic. In the midst of disinformation and misinformation, in the midst of geopolitics, in the midst of what history has offered us as the realities of the world, got magnified exponentially because of something like COVID in realizing that we all have a responsibility to each other and that yes, I am also a religious leader. And this religious leadership needs to also be as audacious and courageous as the interdependence of Hinduism and as the leadership of Pope Francis. But we're not striving to be like those of the past. We are trying to make better quality leaders. They have set examples for us and we are thankful for them, but we are going to continue to do better. This is why when the floodgates of power open, it brings in all of the voices that we still have yet to hear. The untapped potential of the people, the untapped potential of God is still out there and we as religious leaders who look differently, who speak differently and who practice differently have a long way to go to make sure that this power is actually used for its best ability. Thank you so much, Tahil. A lot to think about. We are all religious leaders. How do we um, act with courage and audaciously? So thank you. I'm very happy now to uh, welcome again uh, Patriarch Sabah. Thank you so much for being with us, Patriarch Sabah. It's lovely to see you. M maybe just a few questions to 
begin your part of the conversation. In the movie Francesco, we see Pope Francis' determination and drive to continue to push for justice, even in the face of challenges that feel insurmountable. How do we not despair and keep working in the, and keep working in the face of challenges that appear insurmountable? Could you reflect on your own work, often in circumstances where the challenges seem insurmountable? What motivates you? Thank you for the question. Thank you for inviting me in this uh, panel. Well, your question is uh, about hope, why I hope, despite all the difficult situation in which we keep living. Indeed, the situation here in this Holy Land is since years very difficult to live in. The situation in all the world is not better. Everywhere, as says Pope Francis, everywhere there are problems, violence, killing, hunger, etc. So how we keep, keep hoping despite all the existence of this evil. First of all, because a human existence is just has for, as aim just this, to fight evil. That's the, the, that's the first aim of any human existence. There is an evil, I have to fight it. Therefore, I have to hope to keep hoping. If evil, if I want to, to go to despair because of evil or permanence of evil, well, I will go to die, I will do nothing. I want to live, therefore I want, I keep hoping. Why I hope first, I believe in God. God is good. And he is almighty. And the last word is his, not the, not the evil of man. Here in this holy land, we have much evil. There are people who fight, people who kill, people who hate each other. Jerusalem is a holy city. But today, God is not in Jerusalem. Those who are in Jerusalem are people who invoke the name of God, but God is put away. They are fighting their own name for their own interest, for the nation, for the people, but God is away. This is a problem when, the, when man takes the place of God. When man takes the place of God, he makes himself God. Not being God, he can make only war and violence. Despite this, I say, God is almighty. And at the last, he will have the last word. His goodness will prevail on every human evil, whatever evil in this land, which is holy, which must be holy, and in all the world created by God. Now, second, I believe in the human being itself, himself. God created everyone in his image, which means he made him good as God is good. He made him able to love as God loves. God did not make a man to kill, to be, to be bad. God made him to be good. And even the oppressor here all over the world, he is created by God. Fundamentally, he is good. And therefore, who knows? either himself in his own ideas or, or others speaking to his humanity, who knows, 
but of the apostle himself one day, he will awake, he will see himself a human being in the image of God. He will say, he will see that he is kept, he is able of, to love, he is made to love, not to kill, not to oppress, and perhaps he will convert by himself, and he will see that the other, the one whom he oppressed, is, is still, is being oppressing, is also the same thing, the image of God. That's, uh, I believe in the, hum, in the goodness of the human being as well. Even the oppressors, and there are many here and in all of the world. But who knows, perhaps this uh, fundamental goodness in them, perhaps it will one day be awoken. Third, I believe in the religions. All the religion, every religion, Christianity, Judaism, Islam, and all religions of the Far East, etc. Every religion has two things, two main things, essentials. First, to worship God, to love God. Second, to love the children of God. All religions say this, Christianity say this, you love your neighbor, whoever he is. Islam say the same thing. Everything is a brother. Everyone is your brother. In religion, if he is the same religion, is your brother. If he's not the same religion, is your brother because created by God. So we are all brothers and sisters. This is religion. Now, if everyone is educated in the essentials of, of religion, everyone will know, will be aware that everyone is his brother and sister. The problem in religion, we get lost in external practices. External practices are good to fast, to pray, to go to mass, it's very good. But to be, to be faithful to the religious externalist practices and not to believe in the essentials of religion, God is love and the children of God, if you love God, you must love his children. It is all, all external practices are useless. Even they, they become sometimes obstacles to your true religion. Therefore, I say that religious uh, leaders, they are responsible. A re religious leaders can educate people who love each other in all religion. And they can educate killers in every religion. When they insist on the essence, God is love and love all the child, God's children, they will educate people and peoples who love each other. When they, when they insist that I am the only one who believe and worse, when they take the place of God, when religion is no more religion, it is rather a religious structure in which a human being make himself God. That's the problem. When man becomes God and he is not God, he makes only wars and problems. So religious leaders are responsible for educating new generations. And today, thank God, as we saw with Pope Francis and uh, Sheikh uh, Tayyip of Azhar, they are very aware that religion makes brothers, does not make enemies. 
in the past religions made enemies. Today, some extremist religious, they make wars, they don't make uh, fraternity and brothers. But all this depends from the education they receive, the concept of religion they receive. So I think uh, in order a kind of world manual, world uh, guide, uh, guidebook should be done at the level of uh, the world. Alliance of Peace should perhaps consider this to have a book guide a religious education, world religious education, insisting on the two points, touching nothing in the dogmas or uh, details of any religion. You, you love God, which is true for any religion. You love the children of God. All the creatures are your brothers because if we have this educa universal education, we will have a new a human generation of peace. Until today, the human generations are generations of war. And this is, here comes all the role of the political leaders. The political leaders, whether they believe in God or not, they exploit religion for own, their own interests. And what we see in the Middle East, they are exploit making of religion a new weapon in their wars. Beside all their sophisticated weapons, they add extremism. They they say they are uh, they are fighting extremism, but they are nursing extremism in order to use it for this or that or that. The destruction of the Middle East is one aim today of a Western policy. And destroy and they destroy it with their weapons, and they destroy it with with the religion. Ruling religious extremes. All well, which means now, why I hope, despite everything, there is a fundamental goodness in every human being. And there is a bad inclination of every human being to be bad, to kill, to hate. Until today, the political leaders are only insisting on the bad side, they are making wars. Because they are grounding every their efforts and views on the interest, interest of the nation, okay. But the human being is first, then the human, then the national interest. Here in the Middle East, peoples, hundreds of thousands of peoples were sacrificed, are still sacrificed for the human, for its national interests, world interests. Mm. So that is something the religious leaders have to do, something. Especially this common education based on the two basic essentials in all religion, God and, and, and man. Mm -hmm. And God is the child, is the creature of God, so he's your brother. The universal brother, as says Pope Francis. The political leaders, they need conversion, who will make this? That's the problem. Because the political leaders that I am making, they are converting the, the earth in a hell. Where, where everywhere they may, for us at least, our region, or the Middle East, not only the Holy Land, they are making it a, a land of war, a land of hate. 
So I hope, I believe all, despite all that, I believe in God, God is good and he's more powerful and stronger than all the evil of man, than all the political leaders, even when they pray. Some of the political leaders <laughs> will go to pray. I think God will tell them, tell them, your hands are full of the blood of the innocent in the world. Go wash your hands and come back to pray. Mm. We hope God will speak to these powerful of the world. Thank you. Thank you very much, Patrick Sabah. So much to think about. Uh, there are some questions in the Q&A and I'd like to um, try to pick up some of them. We have a little bit of time left. I would invite those who are uh, participating, if you do have questions, to write them into the Q&A. But this first question um, I, that I'd like to pick up, uh, perhaps uh, Eugenie could uh, respond or begin a response. Uh, in the film, Francesco, uh, you illustrated again and again how concepts that sometimes seem soft, um, closeness, tenderness, and so on, make him, in many ways, make Pope Francis an authentic leader and, and also um, shore up his moral authority, his tenderness and closeness with people, especially at the peripheries in encounter after encounter. Um, were illustrated very well in your film. Um, could you say a little bit more about the notions of closeness and tenderness and encounter and their connection to um, more typical concepts of global leadership, such as dialogue, peace, and justice? What, whatever, what are your thoughts in, in um, uh, producing the beautiful film that you produced, the, the, those particular characteristics of Pope Francis are so striking. How do they relate to his um, leadership? First of all, I want to again, thank everybody for amazing, amazing notes and amazing inspirational points that each panelist mentioned. I was really touched and moved by many words of each of you guys, thank you. And before I'm answering the question, I want to quickly say to Dr. Karam that I am planning in fact to do interface project where I'm bringing every leaders together where like his beatitude said that each leader can in his own words refer to his own religion and point that we're all brothers. So like this, we can bring in front of the world every head of the religion who can inspire people to follow him. Because for me personally, as a filmmaker, I see each of my movies as a triple A effect. A, 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 advocacy, activism, and action, call for action. That's the inspiration that I'm trying to bring for my movies. And I think my next project that I'm already discussing right now is the unification of all leaders together and bringing the ability to show that no matter what religion you are you're talking, they're all similar. They all teach in peace, mm -hmm. they all teach in love. Exactly like his beatitude said, we're all brothers. There is no religion that teaches to kill. We all only teach in peace, and brotherhood. And like was mentioned by, by Archbishop Antonio Desma, the fraternity, the significance of fraternity that Pope Francis signs in his last encyclical last year that he signed, Fratelli Tutti, we all brothers, that the significance of teachings that we need to bring to the world and education need to implement these important values of uh, bringing the important elements of each and every religion that 
we can unite people, that we can educate people from the school and from the college and from the university side, that these future leaders, these people who come in out of these educational institutions, they can go into the big world and be advocates of the unification of people, being a spiritual advocate, no matter which religion they experienced. Now I will go back to the movie and to the question. Good. One of the great examples that we can see in a movie and great examples that I saw, Pope Francis went to the Myanmar and Bangladesh where he literally went to the periphery of the world to meet Rohingya refugees. He not went to Bangladesh to meet Catholics, first of all. He, he wanted to be close to the people, people who are suffering, people who need help, but the most important, through his closeness to them, bring this important element to, to bring the media with him so he can bring also their plight to the bigger world. And I think that's the effectiveness of his leadership to go to the periphery, bring media with him, and through that effect to show to the world important issues that we need to pay attention. Mm -hmm. Now, when I was trying to convince him to go on a camera and do the movie, he said to me, Evgeny, I'm a priest, I'm not an actor. I rather go to the periphery. I rather go to the streets of the world and be close to the people, allowing them to be voice to the bigger world. He tried to bring these voices from the periphery that we as humanity need to hear. And he didn't want it to go and be a actor or somebody in front of the camera. He is a priest. He is a leader and role model. That's what attracted me. His tenderness, I will give you an example with me. For me, what I learned from my interactions with him. You're not feeling the superiority of the leader when he is in front of you. When you are having a conversation with him, he is making you very comfortable. And I saw how he comforting refugees and migrants. Last month, we hosted migrants and refugees from 30 different countries, including Afghanistan. People who just arrived from Afghanistan, they all been in a Vatican, and he came to meet each and every person, listen to each and every story, see how he can help. I think mm -hmm. this is the extraordinary effect of his leadership and his tenderness, his closeness, we can see by going to Lampedusa to meet refugees and migrants, mm -hmm. going to Lesbos, to the camps, to listen to the refugees and migrants, and then to go and talk about these important issues to the bigger world. We can see this on each and every step he is trying to achieve. I think that's the effect of his leadership. I wish that many leaders being able to go to the streets of the world, listen to the people. Even today, when he is announced his synod process for the next three years, he making the church to listen to the people, what people on the periphery wants to say. He yeah. trying to change his institution to the people's voices and not to the leadership of the church, what they want. I think that's the important closeness that he tried to make and also inspire us to go into the world. I'm starting actually the mm -hmm. movie with the quote of San Francisco of Assisi, which says, go into the world, preach the gospel, and if not, use the words. <laughs> exactly. Wonderful. Thank you so much, um, Evgeny. And I, we could go on with this conversation for much longer. Unfortunately, we are out of time. There were more questions, and we will um, uh, try to answer those uh, as we can uh, by email. But what you have shared today is um, extremely important. Um, courage, speaking the language of all faiths. We are all religious leaders. Clearly, interfaith leaders can, in fact, lead us to a new nonviolent paradigm on which to build the new uh, future toward which Pope Francis 
is continually pointing us um, the challenges to everyone and you have uh, described it so beautifully. Thank you all very much and I'll look forward to being in, in continued contact. Have a good day. Thank you. Thank you everybody. Bye.